Hope everyone's doing well. Welcome to the Magia Mindset. Today's guest is going to discuss the evolution of the women's soccer game within the United States and the direction we are heading and discuss the development cycle and how it will complement all the success our U.S. women's soccer national team has had. Our guest has played at the highest level and is currently a vital individual within the women's game in the United States. It is my absolute pleasure and delight to introduce our guest on the show again, Yale Overbach. Roll the intro. Gail, um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I know it's been uh, a long time since our last meeting. I know you have a newborn now. Uh, it's uh, exciting times and hopefully where we're heading in um, the world as well as the game, it's uh, heading in the right direction. Yeah, a lot, a lot has changed since we talked last, for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. I wanted to kind of um, start in the women's game and I wanted to kind of for our audience um, that are listening, what are exciting things to look forward to? What are avenues for, let's say, the young female athlete that's getting in the game and the youth side and they're planning to go to college and then afterwards, what does that road look like and what is it that kind of is evolving within U.S. soccer? Yeah, you know, that's, that's a great question because a lot is changing. And I know I have to actually work to keep on top of this because from the time when I was a young player looking at the path, um, it's changed a lot over the years in, in a really good way. Um, it was great when I was coming up through the scene, but now there are so many opportunities for players. So we're seeing players, one, obviously there's they're still wonderful college programs, like some of the best coaches in our country, probably in the world on the women's side, coach in college. Um, so there are wonderful opportunities there, but then we're seeing players sometimes not playing all four years of college or even going pro before that, whether it's in Europe or uh, in NWSL. And um, the world game at the professional level for women, there are just so many really great opportunities right now. And it's moving in a direction where there's continued investment in it. So we're seeing a lot of the top men's European clubs investing in the women's side. You know, the Women's Champions League final is coming up. Um, and, and the quality of play, especially in Europe, is really, really high. And, and clubs can actually um, now kind of try to entice players with a nice offer financially. Whereas before, you know, if you go where you're going to develop as a player and you'll enjoy yourself, but it wasn't really a usually a question of the financial side. And same thing with NWSL now. You know, we're seeing the they just announced today another small increase in the minimum and maximum salaries. And so, well, the money part isn't everything. It's indicative of kind of a changed mindset. And it's exciting for players to think of the opportunities that they can have as a professional athlete. And that's what drives more young kids to dream of doing that. Just like you see a lot of young boys want to play in the NBA and NFL and stuff because they see that there's an opportunity to be, to have this lifestyle that's really, really cool surrounding the game. And I think we're starting to see the same on the women's side of soccer. No, that's huge. And I think when we talk about the on the men, when they decide that they want to go pro out of high school and if the opportunity is there, because we just talked about it, it's the money. You know that if you sign uh, a, a European contract on the men's side or in the NBA, that money you're going to get, it could be possibly better than a four-year education job you get. And uh, on the female, it's so crazy how that side is growing as well, where before it's like, okay, I go to university, I'm going to a great university, a D1 program, that I got a great four-year education, that that four-year education is going to pay me, that job, that whatever I majored in, is going to pay me more than playing at the highest level. And that that is kind of like outrageous uh, to be able to get an opportunity to play at the highest level. And you might have to consider that you can't do it full time because it's not there. And it's right now it's getting exciting that it's kind of trying to be heading in that direction. What are the, um, let's say if we're going to have a 13 year old that has the potential 14 year old, 
what are the steps to kind of putting yourself in those situations of obviously developing, but also having the right eyes on you. So you're not missing those moments because every age is important of what is the age to get seen to go to a division one? Okay. What is the opportunities to get seen if you want to represent a U.S. national team or you want to play after your division one program? If we can walk through those steps. Sure. So I think a really important thing here is for players not to view it as one chance to be seen and then really to focus more. So it's important to be seen. It's important to have the right, be competing at the right level and have the right exposure. Don't get me wrong. But um, I think that the most important thing for players to focus on is to be the best they can be and that that is an ongoing process. So if you don't get seen for the, one of the top colleges, we see a player like Bethany Belser in the NWSL went to an NAIA college, not even NCAA, and then is playing a starter. She got a chance at the U.S. Women's National Team. I mean, so this is a player who continued to get better and prove her value as a player. So the number one thing isn't being seen, isn't being on the right team with the right connections and getting recruited. The number one thing is to be the best player you can be. So I think for a player, that means watching the top level. You want to be a pro, you need to watch, what does it look like up close person, you know, go to a game in person, go to a top college game. Like what do these players look like when they're playing? What can you do that they're doing already? What do you need to work on to get yourself to that level? Um, and similarly, and analyzing, you know, where you stand, honestly, being able to look and say, okay, well, I'm not able to cover ground like they can. So I need to work on this aspect of my game, or, you know, I really need to get sharper technically if I want to do that. So, so that kind of understanding where you are and what gap there is between where you want to go is huge. And then I think it's about too, when it comes to uh, being seen and having those opportunities, it's about giving yourself a chance to compete against others who have that same goal. That's really important. So often players will say, well, like, what's the right team for me? Or is there a right league to play? And I think it's so much less about that as about you want to be surrounded by others who have this aim. And it's really hard to suddenly arrive in an environment and be kind of an outsider and never having competed at that level. So what you want to do is as many times as possible over the years, whether it's through ODP, whether it's through playing for a top club team, going to one of the most competitive colleges that send a lot of players to the pro level, uh, going to, you know, training with pro teams, whatever it is, wherever you as a player can get yourself in the environment where you're playing with other players who are of that caliber or dreaming of being that caliber is a really, really important thing. No, that's huge. That's huge. Sometimes we get distracted on how do we get there and what teams to be on instead of worrying about the internal stuff, about your own game, your own development, your own touches. And um, it's so funny yeah, how you, you, you talk in such a humble fashion way, but you were an exceptional player. You got to where you got to in UNC by not really getting distracted of going to UNC, but you're putting the work, you're putting the work. And it's, those are the natural places where you put in the work and people see you and they know you can play and you can ball out and they give you opportunities and you're like, oh, okay, that's interesting. Oh, I love the game. I'm doing it. And instead of you searching it, it came in front of you, but it your hard work paid off. I want to now transition on what are the priorities? You know, I think sometimes we watch, especially in today's generation, there's so many apps out there. There's so many YouTube videos and we love the, the freestyle. We love to hit it off a crossbar, chest it, do this. It's, it's so entertaining. And I think some of those videos or highlights um, distracts the players from the priorities that get you at the highest level. If it's division one highest level, when you look back and you're like, what are the fundamentals? What are the foundations and apps and certain things that kind of focus on that, that players kind of need as a foundation? And then from that, add branches that complement them to help them be successful if those colleges want to see more from them you know you i mean you're, you're exactly right is that there's no um tricky magic or anything like that that's going to get you the highest level and i think what happens is players often get bored with the things they actually need to do and i would venture to guess that 
most players, not everybody, most players actually know everything they need to do to be at the high level. I mean, you have the physical side of the game. You got to work on your speed, quickness, endurance, be able to cover the ground, get, get where you need to get on the field, be strong enough to not get injured and take care of your body. You need to have the, the tools with the ball and not to do rainbows or like hit it off the crossbar. Like you said, you need to be able to strike the ball well with both feet, receive it well with all the surfaces of the body. Like all the the real basics. You don't have to do any fancy juggling tricks or anything like that. Like basics to bring the ball under control smoothly, cleanly, and then send it where it needs to go. Um, And then, you know, you think about the mental aspect of the game, you know, having the confidence, the game understanding from watching the game, the positional sense. So I think players are often searching for this, uh, oh, well, like, what is the secret sauce to get to the next level? And the secret sauce is to not get bored of constantly fine tuning and refining those things that you already know. You probably learn 90% of the skills you need to play the game in your first five years playing. Um, But then everyone's searching for like, oh, we're now I'm elite. What do I have to do? You have to keep doing the same thing over and over. And I I saw a quote the other day that I really liked, or just a phrase, and it said, simple, but not easy. And that's kind of the truth. It's like the best players do the simple stuff, but it doesn't mean it's easy to do. It's actually pretty hard to do the simple stuff well under high pressure in a competitive environment, but that stuff doesn't ever change. So, so for players, you know, I mean, I still work on things that players would consider like so basic, but you never get beyond that. And I think that's really the key. So anything you're doing to supplement that, whether it's, you know, using the Techni football app, which is my business, you going on YouTube and searching for training ideas, uh, whether you have a personal trainer or coach that helps you with the mental, physical, technical side of the game, whatever it is that you're doing. If somebody's telling you that, oh, here's a shortcut or here's a, a way to, like, here's something magic that like no one else knows about, don't listen. That is impossible. There's nothing out there that nobody's heard of or no one's, you know, no one's done before that's going to get you there with less work. So I think that's the whole thing. If you're using a tool or resource to help you, that that tool or resource should be teaching you and making it easier for you to put in the work, doing the simple things and the basics and a lot of it. If it's telling you otherwise, then then it's probably leading you off course. <laughs> Absolutely. And and like I said, it's so funny how you have so much access it's unlimited to the amount of resource these youth players have today. It's like, just when you reflect about it, we always say, if I know what I know now and knowing what's available now, if it was available, then could I have absolutely, absolutely could have been better. And that's why I think the game every year is going to get better. When players say, oh, this player back in the day was so much better. Could have been if they were in this environment, but the game is always getting better. If you watch today's game, the women's game or the men's game, and then watch the women's game or the men's game of 1999, it's going to look faster today. It's going to look cleaner today. The, the way the media is behind it better, the way everything, it's evolving. And I think the players got to maximize how to put those right situations and create their own personal training environment if like you said your own app techni app if that's one of my individuals when i'm not with a team but i think one of the things that i have it's funny i've had an argument on is in my opinion the brazilian culture how it it develops such such purity of uh, individually gifted players or even that south american they play they train through games Meaning if it's soccer, tennis, if it's futsal, if it's indoor soccer, if it's outdoor game, if it's street soccer, if it's free, they're playing. And we just talked about you don't get bored is because of those. But I think there's a good balance of if you, because there's so many times, unfortunately, the cult, culture has to complement it. If you can't step out into your backyard and there's constantly people playing, it's hard to go and find that right group. Maybe you might find a group that the level's not high, but that's also another select that you got to have a right level to push you. So I think that's where these apps come into play, like the Techni app, where you're like, okay, I don't have that environment to push me, but I can work on these and get exciting and make it a fun situation because when I get in that environment, I want to show them how much cleaner I am within that. Um, I want to now talk into... How do we create that fun? And I'm talking about, one, the players are responsible. Obviously, if you love what you do, you have to be responsible. But how do the player create that fun 
environment for themselves. And then now this is a very kind of that secret sauce question for the coaches. How do the coaches, because I think now in today's game, coaches reflect a lot and say, if the kids didn't have fun, I have to take ownership. What did I do to not make it fun? What do the coach, coaches got to look at into making those environments more fun? And what do players got to look at into making their own home environment fun? Yeah, so for me, when I hear this question, you know, I'm thinking about it as you're talking, I think it really comes down to, in my opinion, like a healthy competitive uh, atmosphere and competitive mindset and not like sometimes the word competitive takes on a negative meaning. Like it gets so competitive and I don't mean competitive, like someone looking at the record of like winning and losing and coaches trying to win at all costs. I mean, competitive, like what made it fun for me as a kid to go play, whether it was like with a partner doing stuff with a group, like you said, if there's a group playing, that should always be the priority. You don't want to play alone. If there's a group you can play with, it's a team sport, but like whatever it is I was doing, whether it was alone with a group in a team, I was always keeping track of things. I wanted to get better on my scores. I wanted to feel that I was improving. And I don't think that many people could do any activity and feel that they're getting good at it and not enjoy it. To me, that's a fun feeling in life. Like if I were to pick up a guitar and it's not fun for me, if I feel like I'm not getting better, it's frustrating. If I feel like I'm getting good at something, it's really fun. And the same thing for, I think of coaches, like my best coaches, the most fun training and team environments I can think of where, where there was a really good competitiveness. Like we played the same type of games all the time. And it was an appropriate level of competition where we could feel that we're getting better as a team. And like, if you did really well, your, your small sided team would win or whatever it was. And it comes down to like some basic things, like making sure the field is the correct size. If it's too big, you're like so disconnected or if it's too small, it's too frustrating. So something like that, like setting up a good competitive structure where the the, the space is right. And I think too, where there's an appropriate amount of thinking. So you want players to develop and have to figure things out. But like, I've been in sessions where there's so many tactical things and you have to stop every five minutes. Like this is a game where we want to play. So anything where you can play and compete and learn through doing that with different restrictions or whatever, and feel that you're, you're, you're getting better and able to do that, I think is what keeps it fun. To me, that's the whole key is finding the right way to make it competitive and to keep it that the competition having to do with the right things, it's that feeling of doing better than before, not necessarily, oh, we won or we lost on game day. That's not the competition. That's good. No, I mean, that's a, I think that's an art too. being able to find the right cues, say the right words and set up the right players in the moments and give the maybe not too much restrictions, but certain things that the scene is set. And if you can take a step back and at times let a good flow happen and make adjustments, it's vital. It's vital. But I, I think at times when it could be a sign of insecurity or a sign of unprepared when you are constantly stopping things um, as things don't pan out a certain way. But I totally agree because when you look at the game, the game of football or soccer, we like to look at it. At the highest level, or at a lot of levels that we go 45 minutes, it's probably one of the few sports that goes 45 minutes without timeouts, without pauses. So when that game is set up like that, I think the training's got to kind of mirror that. And those moments got to mirror that. You can't freeze them and jump in and say, do that, where you got to kind of trust those players and kind of guide them but let them be the problem solvers because if you're giving constant answers, 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 then when the moment comes, if the free kick is on for a short one, they don't know how to think without coach saying, hey, it's, it's plan one, plan two, A, B, C. It's too many complications where now they're overthinking where the moment didn't require that. And that's so important. What I want to go now from our youth and development into where our women's U.S. national team is currently today. Obviously, we've transitioned from Jill Ellis to our new coach. And um, I wanted to talk about the U.S. women's soccer, but then also trickle into our youth system, into our collegiate system, and kind of our structure set up uh, going. And uh, if we can start out where, where, where we are currently at the highest uh, on our national team, and then we'll kind of transition of how our structure is complementing it um, yeah. and going in that. Yeah. So, I mean, 
just quite simply, we're the best in the world. I think that there was a period of time where we were oh, always ranked one, two, three, maybe three if it was like bad, but where it was kind of like, uh-oh, is the rest of the world catching up? And certainly there's a lot more competition now worldwide. And, and we're seeing national teams with really quality, like 11 quality players. Whereas before, you know, you have a, a lot of the national teams that could, would compete against the U.S. women would have maybe four or five really great players and a big drop off. Whereas I think the quality and depth of the U.S. women's national team is unbelievable. Like they're probably a second 11 and a third 11 that arguably might be able to win a world cup um, on any given day. And so I think that we are, um, we're going in the right direction with it, especially because I feel that now the club environments are starting to support that. So a big concern that I had, and I know it was talked about over the years was like, okay, so we're the number one in the world at the national team level, but like these players outside of national team programming are not playing 11 months through the year in like a really good competitive club environment. And now we're seeing that we're seeing some players going to Europe, some, a lot of players still in NWSL and all of those club environments, the level is, is going higher. So, so the competition for those spots on the best team in the world is just increasing even more. And I, I can't say enough positive things. I'm very public about my support for Vlako Andonovsky, the coach now. Um, I think he's wonderful. I think that he will bring, um, a really unique, detailed approach to some tactical nuances that will just continue to make the team better. So I'm really, I'm really excited about it. And I mean, I think it shows in in just the confidence surrounding the team and their performances, um, even against some of the best uh, competition in the world. You know, it's always a, an excellent chance the U.S. is going to win, and it would be a big upset if someone else did. So I think. In terms of that, the top, top level of the game, we are leading the way worldwide. Um, I'm not, you know, as we look at it trickling down, I'm not as confident in saying that. I don't think that I can identify any problem, but I'm not so sure. You know, I think one challenge we have in the U.S. is just our system is so big and there's so much diversity in it, which is wonderful. But I, I would question, you know, are we properly using that diversity to our advantage and picking the the things where we can systematically make sure we're providing opportunity for as many players as possible and also then promoting and investing in the right group of players to to keep pushing up that pyramid and that's a really complicated question i mean i think we we certainly have wonderful youth leagues we have wonderful like i mentioned some of the best coaches in the game are coaching college um but certainly it's always a work in progress so i don't think that's like uh as set in so stone so to speak as as we are at the top of that pyramid what's your opinion of our if we transition, obviously the national team has their camps. That's that's very complimentary of the international. And Vladko is doing an exceptional job. Exceptional. Has taken the rain from Jill and taken it in a very good direction. And a lot of people feel confident about that. My, my kind of question is anything under that, not the professional, collegiate, the amateur level, collegiate and our youth. How are we, and it's kind of resembling, I mean, I think it's very resembling to the male side as well, Yale. Uh, our collegiate and youth is very resembling on both male and female in America. What's your take on the periodization setup um, and, you know, on our yearly setup? I mean, that's, I think, a lot of our elite coaches that are developing players, that's the kind of dilemma. Is, is there... Is there a dilemma in that? Is still an adjustment we got to make on that? And what kind of adjustment will really allow, we, we just said on the female side, we're in the best in the world to, to even go this much more in development aspect? Well, it's interesting because I think we see like this uh, competing forces, if I'm thinking of it, like the way I view it. And one is that like, I think we, we all acknowledge the college, short college season with the rest of the year is not, that's not an ideal way if you want to aspire to be a professional athlete and the same thing i would say with like the club structure i can't speak as clearly to that so i don't even understand the schedule so well it's so crazy to me but like in general there's way too much travel and too many games versus local competition and training in my opinion um 
But that being said, it's really interesting because we have this a really big pool of players in the US who are kind of at this like pretty elite level, but they're not like necessarily on track to be pro players. So what would happen elsewhere is that if you're at a pro academy, you're on track, your periodization, your training and game and competition schedule is all set up for to maximize your development as a player so that you can go pro and make as much money as possible for the club that's developing you. It's a very simple path. And there's not that many players who are in that structure. It's only the best of the best. Here we have hundreds of thousands of players who are in this elite track. They're playing, you know, in one of the top elite youth leagues in the country. They're going to a, a division one college. And um but most of them, I mean, they're student athletes. They have another priority. They are uh, youth players who maybe don't even want to go on to play professionally or play in college even. They're just participating because they're, you know, in an elite youth club. So I think because of that, it's really interesting because it's like, well, if you're paying all that money and you, you're participating, you should have more events and tournaments and the part that the kid thinks are fun. But if your goal is just to make it to the top and to represent the U.S., on the national team and to play professionally, then you would structure it differently. So I think where we have is we have this lack of clarity. There's so many players in this big pool of like participating in what would be a pathway to the pros, but actually a lot of them, I would argue, don't even really intend to be professional players. They probably like it if it happens, but they're not like, this is what I'm going for. So because of that, I think it's just, there's too many, there's a conflicting structure and conflicting goals. Yeah. And <laughs> I think in America, when you have such great resources and opportunities, uh, a lot of opportunists are always going to take advantage. And I think the biggest thing we go back to is the business. So you're going to have business and development always conflicting. And it's until we can get people for the purity and there's, there's, there's like always people in those roles and uh, that can say, you know what? Let's change the structure. Obviously, um, it might not profit as much in the starts of here, but development-wise, player-wise, the way the the both side because we are heading the next World Cup for the female, and even the one we host for the men in 2026, the two teams being put together on the path we're at. I mean, it is so much excitement for the U.S. on the soccer on both female and male that I think it's such a great time to take advantage of can we make it um, a year round for the university and spreading out the games. And it gives colleges a more hands on. So when the players were not ready at 18, 17 to go pro, this is kind of like the reserve setup and they they're training like that so then when they transition out they can go because it's funny um yeah the academy we have set up on our youth we have a fully funded project that we're doing on the men and women so our summer program is all the college athletes are coming in but then you, you also have to respect ncaa five of that program can't be together here like to me a lot of those restrictions like it, it takes away what happened if this program had the best players and they wanted to be in the structure to go against these other ones. But, but because NCAA doesn't want teams or players to be structured in certain way, sometimes those restrictions to make the competition a little bit even or business-wise to be even, it kind of hurts those parts and we always have to try to abide by it. But whenever the bigger associations, I think, come together, there's, there's so much positives. But that being said, I think we're always, every year, people are listening. They're slowly making adjustments and we're always going forward, I believe, in my humble opinion. What I wanted to kind of bring it in full circle and wrap, uh, wrap our episode with is kind of what you are currently doing, um, any projects, what organizations you're affiliated with, things that you're looking at and how the game is um, evolving from all of the, the projects being put together as things are opening up for our audience to be aware of, to kind of, you know, get into so they can better help develop their kids. It helps better enhance our game and we can kind of go on there. Yeah. So my, um, my main, uh, my main job is, is running things with Techni football. Uh, that's, you know, it was really busy this last year and continues to be, but I think, you know, what I'm working to do now is a lot of it is education. I think, especially for 
parents, coaches, and players on like, why, why does it matter to train on your own? And that training on your own isn't what, you know, you brought up before. It's not the practicing some flashy tricks. It's not the playing crossbar, you know, against a friend. That That's fine. Those are fun. I recommend players spend time with the ball however you want to, but that's not training on your own. So it's education surrounding why it's important to, to spend this extra time with the ball and what that should look like and can look like if you really actually want to get better. So a lot of it is education surrounding that. Um, and and it, on the tail end of the pandemic, I think people realized that they could do a lot of stuff on their own, but don't realize that that's the norm you should always be doing to supplement. You know, you have something with a group three, four times a week. Great. But that those other days, if you're really a soccer person, you're not just sitting at home doing other things. You're you're finding a way to get better at soccer. Um, and then so so that's my my full full time. And um, additionally, I still am, uh, I'm an advisor uh, for the NWSL Players Association. So I'm still very involved in the pro side of things. A lot of my great friends are playing and coaching in that league. So I stay very tied in with that league as well as watching the men's game. You know, I'm very, um, I'm very involved in the sport in a lot of capacities, whether it's through actual work or just uh, enjoyment. But, um, but yeah, my main daily work is on stuff with technique football. No, you're doing a great job with it. And uh, that that app, if anyone has not got onto it, needs to get onto it because it's a great way away from your team environment instead of watching TV, playing games to get in something that you actually love. You love to get better. And the more you can maximize to individually get better, the game is more fun. When you know you're stepping on the field and you're like, man, I've used Techni app. I've used this YouTube video. I've been constantly out here. This is my private coach. This is my strength coach. And if you're able to get all of those resources and then you know that confidence and you're well-rounded to go there and you're stepping on that field and you're excited that everyone's here and you're going to put a show and they're watching you, of course, that they, they say that 1%, only 1% make it. Of course, you just can enter that, you have a chance to enter that 1% when you've put everything, all your time, there's 24 hours in a day. Obviously, they say it's good to get six to eight hours of sleep if, or a little bit more sometimes, but there's a lot still remaining that you can maximize if you want to really get that. And I think there's so many people that say it, but actually when it comes down to it, they don't get around it. And I think there's better ways to enhance. And I think it starts from our home environments, from parents and coaches, putting the right things around it. And I hope those things continue because then when we sit back, when we're watching a game on TV and that next generation is representing it, you're like, wow, this is fun to see. And at least we were a little bit of a compliment to it. And we're kind of seeing that growth. And I think those are exciting things. But I wanted to kind of wrap that out and say thank you so much, Yale. It was such a great dialogue. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure. And um, thank you so much for getting on the episode again. Yeah, thank you. I always enjoy the conversation. So I appreciate you and the platform you provide. Thank you. Have a great one. You too. 